Okay, good morning and thank you. Um, that's the, uh, the title of my presentation this morning. Uh, I began life as a drama teacher, so um, it's, probably, it's probably not the first time in the last fortnight that people have said, what the hell are you doing here? Um, before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the uh, Noongar Wajuk people as the traditional owners of the country on which uh, Curtin's Bentley campus sits. And uh, I wish to acknowledge their continuing connection with the land, sea and community and I pay respect to their elders past, present and future. Uh, I've just returned from an uh, a, um, Indigenous cultural immersion program for last week as well. This is, this is standard practice at Curtin anyway. But uh, it was really interesting to see just how much uh, shift is occurring uh, in the Indigenous space and, and reconnecting with community and land and those sort of things. So uh, that will play into this future that we're facing as well, with this digital future that we're facing. Um, I just want to talk about... Um, notions of big data. I was asked to talk about a range of things today and um, it'll actually be a journey, it'll be a narrative, there'll be little bits where you can stop and, uh, and participate. Um, my suggestion is that we're at a time much like where these guys started talking about quantum physics. That we're at a stage where we're fundamentally shifting our understanding of the world that we live in. These guys started to, to show very different ways of understanding the world. It was all Newtonian physics, it was all about mechanics, and we shifted into a world where we began, began to understand notions of uncertainty, notions of uh, you can only know something's position or its speed, but you can't know both. And I think that reflects something that somebody was saying here this morning. Um, so in terms of big data, in terms of computation, in terms of a whole range of things, we're in a very, very new space. And the thing I think that's going to drive that through the future will be a notion of creativity. Oh, this is slow on here. These, um, these are the relative chunks of time I'm going to try and spend uh, speaking about things. And I'm hoping, I saw on the program we've actually got a Q&A later, so I might fudge it a bit and, uh, and talk a bit more during that. Uh, Curtin has begun a process of transformation. Somebody finished up with the notion of, uh, sorry, it was Charles, wasn't it? Finished up with the, the notion that digital transformation isn't easy. And I can attest to that. We've been working in that space for quite a few years in the education space here at Curtin. Um, these sort of spaces, these big lecture halls, are rare. We've shifted away from them, we've shut most of them down, we've converted them into new sorts of spaces. These are the sorts of spaces that we're working in, where people sit around tables, engage with each other, engage with technology, and having someone standing at the front of a space like this is a relatively rare occurrence nowadays. It's not gone completely, and there'll probably still be a place for it somewhere into the future, but increasingly, we're moving into a space where learners and students are co-located. And as a school teacher back in the, you know, I started back in the 90s, um, I was already in that space, particularly as a drama teacher. I had space that, you know, no desks, no chairs, big empty space, and we all sat on the floor together. And I know that that is shifting into more and more areas of uh, educational practice anyway. Largely driven by a better understanding of education, which is coming from better understanding of data, and also um, the influence of technology. So, the things that are driving the change at Curtin are, in one thing, a, a new technology shift. So, around the world, we are engaging, we want to engage with, with more and more students around the world. We have, we used to just have that, uh, the situation where people who came to Curtin lived in the state somewhere. They would apply through the standard TISC pathways, get an ATAR as it is nowadays, T-E-R, -E I think it was when I was there. Um, and and the, the pathway through would, would be from university. Increasingly, the international market started to grow. And also, universities around the country and around the world started saying, well, we want your students as well. And so now there's a global battle on for you know, en uh, engaging with learners. Uh, some of you may have encountered edX and Coursera, the big MOOC providers. Curtin is now um, one of the partners of the edX program. So that gives us contact with three million students, potentially. And that's a scale that most of us, certainly when I was a school teacher, I had 25, 30 kids in my class. How do I engage three million? Something that's a, it's a big shift. And the way that we do that is through technology. 
And uh, we've always said a couple of these other elements here this morning too, is that students have got a lot of choice. They don't have to come to Curtin anymore. They don't have to go to UWA. They can sign up for places all around the world and they don't even have to leave their lounge room to do it. <coughs> and as um, I think it was yeah. Ian this morning pointed out too, he expects a certain degree of job readiness as an employer and that's another dimension that comes through. That's me, I won't waffle on too much about that. I was asked to talk about uh, cloud computing. Is everyone familiar with cloud computing generally? Anyone not? Anyone confident to give me a better definition than the one I have? <laughs> no. Okay. In, in many ways, cloud computing is, is simply a, a network of computer systems that are remote from where you are. Uh, for many of us, the biggest cloud computing system that we know is the internet. There are all sorts of other cloud computing systems that exist alongside that and within that. And as you've probably seen with talk about the dark net and the Silk Road and all those sort of things, there's a whole other side of the internet that you generally don't get to through your standard Internet Explorer uh, browser. So the, uh, the cloud allows you to store data somewhere else. So rather than having a data store on your, your laptop all the time, you probably find those of you who've got laptops, your hard drive is shrunk in some ways over the years as the devices got smaller. And those of you with uh, tablets and that sort of thing, what's this storage thing? Um, it's all stored remotely. We all have Google Drive accounts. We all have Dropbox accounts. They're all part of the cloud. There's also parts of the cloud that allow you to do processing remotely. So we have a supercomputing centre over here at uh, Technology Park. And we have researchers on campus here who will process vast volumes of data using that system over there. To use their system, you have to have a minimum of one terabyte of data to run a process. Um, but they do that remotely. There's a warehouse-sized building over there with a very small <laughs> um, computing system in it because when they, when they started planning for a supercomputing, they needed something the size of this space here. Now they need something about from here to that wall. It's shrunk that much and it's processing it at phenomenal rates. I can't remember the, the number of floating point operations per second, something like 1.2 billion or, or more. Um, and the numbers that we deal with have gone from millions and billions into things like brontobytes, which is uh, 10 to the power of 27. That's the sort of things that we're gearing up for. So we're talking about some very, very large scale shifts in understanding. Does everyone know what data is? What is data? Sorry? Unorganised information. Yep. Anyone else got a definition? So basically data is any collection of information that we want to process or want to, we want to try and make meaning from, is my definition. And where does it come from? Okay. We, we talk about uh, qualitative data and, and quantitative data. Quantitative data is numbers, largely anything that can be expressed in numerical form. Qualitative data is other kinds of data. So there's an ice cream there. What quantitative data could we imagine that we could collect about that ice cream? Mass, temperature. Wow. Yep, so how heavy it is, what temperature it is. Pardon? Colours. Okay, I'm getting, maybe do the raise of hand. <laughs> Sorry, what was that one? Sorry. How many scoops? Yeah, you can count the number of scoops. You could probably put some sort of... Uh, light measurement on it and determine what colour scales are operating there. There's a whole range of things. What qualitative judgments can you make about this? Or what qualitative data could you collect about this? Taste, what does it taste like? Sorry? Yeah. So how much crunch, how much noise does it make, those sort of things. And that could also be quantitative too. Favourite flavour? Favourite flavour, yeah. What data is going to tell me if I like it? <laughs> Without tasting it, what data will tell me whether I like it or not? <laughs> Experience might. So some of my own bits and pieces. But until I taste it, I probably won't know. I can predict whether I might like it based on previous experiences. But there's still that leap into the unknown. There's a degree of uncertainty. It might look really nice. It might look like a strawberry flavoured ice cream at the front there. 
but it actually might be something quite different. It might be persimmon. It might be pomegranate, something that I'm not as familiar with. So once we collect data, we start thinking about what do we do with it. So we have to manage our data in some ways. So one way we do with numerical data is we stick it, or in fact not only numerical, a lot of data we put into database systems. So your standard sort of Excel spreadsheet uh, is, a, is one that we're very familiar with, but that can scale up to massive arrays of data. As I said, the, um, the sorts of data that's being used with the, with the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre starts at one terabyte of data. So have you got an Excel spreadsheet that's one terabyte in size? I don't think many of us do. However, uh, Stephen Tingay, who's collecting data from the square kilometre array and the Murchison array, those sort of figures mean nothing to him. He's collecting data at such a phenomenal rate uh, through, from uh, the telescope systems that uh, you know, a, a terabyte of data he can, he can probably generate in the course of this presentation. Metadata is about organising your data and being able to retrieve it, share it and understand what the data actually is. So when you have things like, um, a any, do we have any librarians in the room? School librarians? No? Librarians understand metadata because that's about how you go about finding a book in the library is by understanding the metadata, how it's organised, how it's stored and where it's located. And that's the same sort of thing. Is everyone familiar with the de metadata debates in government? Data retention? Yep. So we've all heard it. So we label our data. So I know that if I collect a lot of data, I store it in a particular type of file type. The type of file that it is contains metadata. The categories under which I organise my data can be metadata. Um, I can label it with keywords so I can find it again. So how many people store away their Word documents and, and fill in the little information box that pops up behind when you go to um, document information? It's where you change the author's name, the date it was produced. You do? You're possibly the only one in the room. <laughs> but for those, of us, those people who run businesses, that sort of thing can be quite critical, is understanding when a, you know, what version of a document are you working on? Who made the changes to it? So that sort of information is metadata. And that applies to all sorts of data sets. And data cleansing is about how do you make sure that the data you're using is, has integrity? How do you make sure that there's not unnecessary duplication of figures in there? How do you know that there's not aberrant information in the collection that you have? How do you go through making sure that the data is relatively accurately representing what you intended to collect? Okay. Oops. So the terms big data. Um, big data is, is often to do with the size of the data collection. Um, and you see in here some of the numbers. If you can, I'm not sure. Pretty good. You can see here 2.5 quintillion, see eight zettabytes. These are not numbers that we use in our, um, in our daily lives normally, unless we're working in sort of... Uh, spaces where we're handling bits of, of information. Oops. So the, uh, the 13 P's is one way of doing it. There's also five V's of describing uh, what big data is about. So portentous data is it's huge. It's perverse in that it's, uh, it gives an ab incredibly detailed um, description of material if you know how to read it. Uh, data can be personal, and there's a whole lot of things there. I, I can provide references for these sort of things later if anyone wants to follow up. But um, the, the term is more generally becoming to the, the entire set of processes that relate to handling data. So big data collection, and we saw little examples of it each of the, the earlier presentations. Big data collection is not just having a massive astronomical volume of data coming down, but, it, but using data as a basis for your decision making. So more and more organisations are able to, to capture 
different types of data. So we've talked about people capturing um, customer data. We've talked about uh, with the, the transmedia approaches is you know, who's reading stuff, what are their preferences, those sorts of things. That's all different sorts of data. Um, how do you make decisions on that? And I think it was Ian said that he has a three year business cycle. But with the right sort of data and the right sort of analysis, it could be that those business cycles start to change. Particularly with things like supply, supply chain logistics and things like that where uh, if I know that the demand is going to drop off for a short period of time, I can notify my suppliers, well I don't need so many of these elements to put into my production line. So my, my business can start to become more adaptive and more responsive to market trends. And so while there's a slump off in the market, it doesn't mean that your business dies, it just means that you need to adapt it in some way. With good data, you can predict what those changes might be. But it's a bit like the ice cream. It's until you taste it, until you try it, you won't actually know how good those predictions are. So where does all this data come from? It comes from us, basically. Every time we touch a digital item, we, we leave some sort of trace. Um, Every time we speak to somebody, there's potentially data there. If we record it, capture it, and come back to it, if it gets written down, it becomes data. Um, human beings notoriously collect things. Human beings notoriously make patterns of things. And that becomes data. We build devices that measure things. And every time we measure something, we create a new data stream. And that will, this is going to start leading us towards the Internet of Things. Um, you're all school teachers, so you're all subject to various forms of data collection in schools. You've got the generic, you know, this is what the ideal student looks like or the average student data. You've got broad spreads of this is where we sit in the system. You've got the individual student data that you're using to make decisions about an individual student's progress through their learning journey. You've got that aggregated data where the individual student becomes less of a significant feature rather than the aggregated sum of how does that create an average or a generalised perception of all students in your context and then that grows to, to be aggregated with, sis, uh, with sector data and so how do all schools in WA get represented through data sets, how does that then feed into the federal level and then when you get the big international stuff like the PISA surveys and those sorts of things, how does that fit into a global perception of where students are, how learning's happening and all those sorts of things. So from a, from a teaching and learning point of view, <coughs> we've been dealing with data for a very long time, but we haven't necessarily framed it in those ways and we haven't necessarily used aggregated forms of data for decision making about individual learners. So anything we count, anything we record, anything we measure is a data source. So. As I said, I'm a drama teacher, so I'm probably stepping on these guys' territory here in terms of big data and business. But the, uh, the normal process when, people, when businesses start using data, they normally start monitoring their business. Is they use it as a way of what has happened in my business, how do I understand what's, what the history of my business is expressed through numbers or through graphs, visualisations. And then from there they start to get insights. They start to understand that, okay, I'm spending an awful lot of money in this particular area of my business and I'm not generating as much money from that same area. So they get some insight into how their business is actually functioning. So then they use that information to optimise their business. Okay, how can we reduce the expenditure and increase the profits or how can we do away with that area altogether if it's not worth it? They start uh, changing their business. Clever businesses then start to monetize their data. How do, I, how do I use this data in my business to generate income? Some businesses sell that data, as we know with Facebook and Google and all sorts of other organisations. They sell data. It's a big part of what they do. Market survey companies, it's what they do. In many ways, it's what the media does. It sells you as a number to other people, advertisers. And then eventually, data can be used to actually completely transform your business. And as Charles indicated, that's not necessarily an easy journey.
particularly when the technologies involved in some of those processes fall into this landscape. Now, I talk about this stuff on a weekly basis, but there's a lot of logos in that, in that model there that I don't recognise. There's a few that I do, so Hadoop, if you're looking at uh, talking about uh, managing big data and managing data sets, Hadoop is a, a big player in the field. It's something that attaches to, uh, to web server systems, ties into the Apache system as I understand it. Um, so you have infrastructure, you have the technologies that handle and, and organise the data. You have the apps that allow you to in interpret the data. There's a whole system too of things that feed data into the system as well. So has anyone read the news about Fiona Stanley just lately and the collection of blood monitoring data in terms of the blood pressure monitoring? Their data system, they've got their devices, they put the sphygmomanometer onto your arm and it reads the numbers off but it doesn't feed it into their data collection system. So they're paying a nurse to sit there and record the numbers that the machine displays. So having an integrated system is very, very important, especially when it's your blood pressure and your health that's being reported on. And in this system, the sort of data that uh, you're collecting could be reflecting the health of your business, could be reflecting the health of the economy that you're a part of. It could be reflecting any dimension that impacts on you and the activities that you engage with each day. Has anyone visited this website? No? I'll see if I can bring it up on uh, in real time. Oh. Oh. Okay, the, the, uh, the resolution of the screen won't let me get it. Uh, up to me, but as you can see here, this is, this is reading real time, displaying real time data uh, about a range of websites. And as you can see, it's changing fairly quickly. Someone mentioned, uh, Charles again, I think it was mentioned WordPress earlier on. So you can track the number of blog posts while we're sitting here watching this. So how many uh, plus one comments are occurring on, uh, on Google Plus? what the ad revenue of Google is. Now, I, I activated this um, just as Ian was being introduced. So in that time that we've been sitting in here, Google's generated over $2 million in ad revenue, which, as Charles pointed out, is probably a lot less than they would have been getting 10 years ago. <laughs> but from our point of view, that's still quite large. So this gives you an indication of what's going on. So Amazon in the last few hours have sold 67,000 objects. They might be digital, they might be physical. There could be a drone turning up soon to deliver one. <laughs> Facebook. Facebook's numbers just get too hard to read. They move so quickly and they get so large so quickly, mainly because of the density of users. So how do you and your students begin to engage with numbers that shift at this speed and at this sort of scale. How do businesses make sense of this sort of data? How, do, how does Facebook begin to engage with their 8,000 gigabytes of data that's passed through their servers in the last couple of hours? Interesting question to consider. So, um, and we'll talk in a moment about um, computational thinking and, yeah, and use of computational strategies to deal with that. Increasingly, we're the university sector, and I can see it, we're, I'm, I'm engaged with uh, engagement activities and we, we do a lot of outreach work, and currently we're looking at, at uh, programs that we can take to high schools and even down into primary schools. And the stuff that we're thinking about is coding, computation, uh, and making stuff with technology, um, including things like how do we use simple microprocessors and data sensors to generate data streams that 
for the students. How can the students understand that they can collect data, analyse data, visualise data and use that data to make decisions? And we're looking at taking that down to about grade four or five at the moment. So I'm guessing for many of you that probably means that those kids are going to be hitting you in the next five or six years. <laughs> now if you're facing retirement, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> if you're thinking about staying on, how are you going to adapt to these shifts that are occurring? So I was going to suggest a little activity because this was originally um, going to be a, a workshop activity in a different sort of space. But those of you who do have a, um, a device, I invite you to, to visit one of these three data collection sites, uh, data repository sites. Now in Australia, the US, the UK, there's an increasing movement towards what's called open data. So our researchers who are funded by federal money, so under ARC funding or um, the Office of Learning and Teaching type funding, there's a requirement now that they make their findings available in open access journals and increasingly there's an obligation for them to make their data available so that their results can be checked, replicated and used in other studies. Those data collections are ending up in repositories like these. So, just pop out of there again. Whoops. So, this is the US government's open data repository. And you can see here, there's a range of topic areas by which the data is organised. This is using metadata to organise it into these categories. So we have agriculture, business, climate, a whole range of other topics there. The focus of today might lend itself to going into business. So I can start tapping into various data streams and data resources. That's all right. Um, <laughs> okay. So these sites. This size agency here is that the, um, the data set is intended for public access and use. There's no license provided, so pretty much you can do what you like with this data. And uh, because it's being given away globally, any organisation in the world, any individual in the world can access this data if they're not behind a restrictive uh, internet access system. And even if they are, if they, they take two minutes, they can normally get past that. Um, now, what this means is that you can work with real world data in your classrooms. So you can scour these data sets, download the raw data that was generated by whatever study or investigation was undertaken and manipulate that data in whichever way you want. The challenge there is do you know how to do that? Do you know how to represent that data in visual ways, ways that can, can give you uh, simpler ways of understanding what you're looking at. And as you can see here, we're talking about metadata, the whole lot of the sort of terms that are used to identify keywords in this data set. There's a unique identifier for the data so that you can reference this data if you use it in any formal way. And you can even access the person who looks after it via their email. Now what I was going to do in the workshop session was get people to download and sit in small groups, but that's not going to work today and the time's sort of running against us. So um, think about it, have a look at it. Those systems uh, when it comes to thinking about how you engage students with real data because you can actually take real world problems, go and find collections of data that are related to those real world problems and start to define possible new solutions to those problems. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that 
at Curtin in the next few minutes. In terms of big data in education, um, has anyone heard of the Experience API or the Tin Can API? <coughs> no? Basically what it is, it's, uh, it's a little system that connects any application that you use in a learning environment. So if you're using a, a learning management system, if you're learning some, using some sort of learning app, if you're using things like, uh, you, potentially you could even do it with things like iTunes courses, you know, iTunes University courses, anything else. What it will do is it sits under the, um, the experience that the, the user is having and it collects data. So we use it in a system where we track every choice that a learner makes while navigating a particular set of activities that we set up for them. Now we can use it, that data in a whole series of ways. We can use it to give feedback to the learner about their progress. We can look at the patterns and say, okay, are there common ways in which learners engage with this material? So we can make more general inferences about um, designing learning activities. Yeah, yeah, digital stuff, yeah. Digital stuff, yep. Um, and you can even run it in behind, so it can sit there, collect the data, and, and then feed it when you're disconnected. So it could even be used in sites like prisons and that sort of stuff where they're, they're not connected to the net, but they're still using digital resources. So, um, and it also allows us to, to then uh, think about how can we modify the application or the platform that we're using so that it services the learners better. So this comes under the realm of learning analytics. And increasingly, it's, it's already on the uh, Horizon reports. Everyone familiar with the Horizon reports, the New Media Consortium's Horizon reports on the technology horizons in education? They predict, uh, there's a, they use the Delphi method, which is a, a committee approach to looking at what's going on in the world, filtering down what are the most um, influential technologies being implemented across education around the world, and they publish that into a, into a report every year. Learning analytics, I think, is on the horizon for the next two to, two to three years, where it starts to become mainstream. They're not always right, but their track record is pretty good. So that brings us to the Internet of Things. I'm going to start trying to tile this up in the next few minutes. But um, the Internet of Things is that connection of all of those uh, computers and servers and other bits and pieces around the world, plus every little sensor, plus every little wearable device that you've got that talks to a computer, every iPad, every iPhone, every heart rate monitor that's connected to a computer network, every meteorological sensing system out in the world, Every tagged whale, every tagged lion, but poor old Cecil's not transmitting anymore. <laughs> and all that data is feeding into, they're, they're all being generated by the Internet of Things. And each one of those things is creating a data stream of some sort. This one here is giving me an hour by hour connection of how many steps I take, how long I sleep, whether it's deep sleep or light sleep. Um, it can connect to a set of scales I've got at home, but I've resisted going there. Um, and it starts to give me a picture of what's my performance like. Am I living a healthy lifestyle? Am I active enough? Am I sleeping enough? No, no, no. Um, but this is feeding into that wealth of data that's happening around the world. The Internet of Things is creating a, a huge volume of data that we don't even know what it's telling us. We don't even know the questions to ask of the data. Has anyone seen thingful.net? Every little coloured speck on that map, and that's a, a long way back. As you start to drill into it, you find individual little spots. And they are searchable data sources, sensors. So the one that I flagged there is Diane. It's a female blue shark. It was, at this time here, it was spotted off the west coast of South America and there are millions upon millions of other devices in there connected generating data and a lot of it is publicly accessible. So you could tap into streams of data. You could follow Diane on her trails around the world if she travels around the world, if she doesn't get 
caught up in a, a, game, a game fishing expedition. But um, this is just one way that we can actually visualise how the world is growing in terms of data, data collection and engagement with data. And this one here is called Shodan. This is a search engine. This allows you to search for any webcam, any router, any device that's connected to the net. And I don't know whether you can see on that one. You can't, yes, you can't read it on that particular scale there, but the, the little map of the world, you've got two little flags above that, two little buttons. <laughs> the one with the red button next to it says exploits. So you can actually go search for webcams, then go and find other exploits that you can engage with that will allow you to utilise that webcam in some way. So you've all read about people being able to take charge of, a web, of your webcam on your laptop. So for all we know, you could be being broadcast along with this presentation somewhere in the world. There's a search engine to help you do that now. It provides MAC numbers in some cases. It provides IP addresses. Uh, and very often it puts a flag up saying, yeah, there's, a, there's a, an exploit available for this. It's not illegal at the end, as yet, but it sort of starts to point to how the Internet of Things is infiltrating everything that we do. Every time you turn a phone on, every time you take a photo of your kids, your grandkids, your pet, yourself, most commonly, um, you are engaging with the Internet of Things. Curtin has partnered with uh, Cisco, and we now have one of uh, the Cisco hubs for the uh, Internet of Things. And it's just over here, just on the other side of the grassed, grassed area. Um, if you, as you go out through the, uh, the foyer here, turn left and the, um, the Cisco Centre of Innovation for the Internet of Things is over there. So we're going to be working a lot with Cisco and our researchers, finding ways to use the Internet of Things to generate even more data. <laughs> and hopefully, being a university, we come at some sort of understandings about the world as a result of that. Data mining used to be physically going through lists of numbers, and this is where computation comes into it, is that increasingly you have to think about how can you frame a problem in such a way that you can put the available data into some sort of computational system to let it do the processing for you. Because I can promise you that you'll get very tried trying to process zettabytes of data by yourself. Just the printout would probably take several generations of your family. So you need to tap into this world of big data. You need to start thinking in computational ways. That raises questions about ethics. Who's allowed to collect your data? Who can have access to it? Who, what can they do with it? We've seen this face around a fair bit in recent years. We're worried about them. The faces that we don't see. Oh, this is a, one of the quotes that came out of a conference just recently, is that ethics will be the defining quality of 21st century business. In order to provide you with a service, I need to collect your data in many ways. If I want to provide you with a personalised service, I have to know a little bit about you. So I have to collect some sort of data. What I do with that data will be what marks me as a, a good, reliable business or not. And, and it's interesting, the, the debate around data collection and everything else, there's, there's a lot of sides to the discussion. Most people are concerned about security. Who collects the data? You know, do we want the guy in the anonymous mask having access to our data? Is he a black hat hacker or is he a white hat hacker? Is he an Edward Snowden or is he someone else? How does your business sit, or how the business of, the, of our students in the future, how will that sit in those sort of spaces? Anyone recognise those buildings? The Asia building? General Communications Headquarters outside of London. Yep, GCHQ. And um, the NSA building. The bottom right corner is uh, one of the SSA, uh, NSA's data analysis rooms. They work with visual representations of data. So they're not ploughing through for individual little numbers. They represent the data in visual ways so that anyone with a moderate amount of training can say, look, there's an anomaly. There's something happening there. And that's increasingly how businesses need to start operating. Not every business but at this stage, but a lot of businesses are having to function in that sort of way. 
in order to get that edge on your decision making processes. The earlier you can find out where things are starting to happen, the better. And internet privacy we've briefly mentioned. Data visualization, there's all sorts of ways of visualizing data and there's a whole lot of tools you can use to do that very simply. People are even 3D printing data nowadays so you can actually physically, tangibly hold the data in your hands, manipulate it, feel it. So there's a tactile dimension. And I've alluded to this on several points throughout. Is how can you formulate your problem and their solution so that the solutions are represented in a form that can be effectively carried out by an information processing agent? Is how do you engage with computational thinking? How do you think about porting data into a system and producing meaningful results? Uh, at Curtin, we're developing a challenge platform where we're using the leverage uh, API underneath this. So this is a, a small self-directed learning activity. We're currently trialling it with careers and leadership. Talk about challenge-based learning, keep authenticity at the fore. I'll get to my summary page. And for some reason, this didn't give me the presenter's view on my screen here, so I can't jump. So the other thing I was going to talk about is blue sky. The, the options for finding solutions nowadays are much grander. We're not limited by what we can think about anymore. We can actually think beyond um, standard limitations into, sort of, into ways where there's more creative solutions possible because the technology will do it. If you take nothing else away today, start with familiar data, start with the available tools, so Excel spreadsheets, look at things like RapidMiner or Tableau software as ways of visualising data. There's whole systems, Google will create data streams for you and help you visualise it, uh, track down their open data systems. Start sooner rather than later. Start with unlimited thinking. Don't be bound by, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that. Start with, we want to do this, and then work out how to do it. Um, understand how to work with data. Collaborate at every opportunity. The modern world is not an individual exercise. We're travelling together. Strive for authenticity. Critically engage with the changes. Take in the long view and actively engage with complexity. Don't be afraid of it because it looks hard. Because it's only going to get harder and if the gap widens, we end up with all sorts of problems. Thank you very much.